Hi there and welcome from Ventura, California to Unmanned Systems Week. We're kicking off Unmanned Systems Week today with our first webinar on positioning, navigation, and guidance for unmanned systems, sponsored by Novatel and Inside GNSS and hosted by WebAttract, the leaders in thought leadership webinars. My name is Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders, as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they discuss various GNSS techniques and options to meet operational requirements for unmanned systems operating in air, land, and sea environments. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Experts panel session with all three of our panelists today. Now joining us today, we have a diverse audience of professionals registered from 43 countries, 30 states and provinces, representing a variety of industries. And over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident you'll find today's webinar of value. Before we get started, Glenn Gibbons, editor and publisher at Inside GNSS, would like to take a moment to welcome you and introduce our main moderator for today. Over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Lori. On behalf of Inside GNSS Magazine, our sponsor, Novotel, and our panel of experts, I welcome you to this first installment in a three-part web seminar series on unmanned systems. Now, the subject of these webinars is as current as the headlines in the news. After the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 this spring, many of us became familiar with the exploits and capabilities of the Bluefin 21, an autonomous underwater vessel that plumbed the depths of the Indian Ocean looking for the missing airliner. Then last month, the leading unmanned system conference, AUVSI 2014, drew more than 6,000 attendees and 600 exhibitors to Orlando, Florida to explore the latest innovations and advances in unmanned air, land, and sea vehicles. And just last week, Google announced plans to build a fleet of 100 experimental electric-powered cars that will do away with the standard controls found in some conventional, or in all conventional automobiles. And those cars will be on the roads not in some distant science fiction future, but on California highways next year. So these and related developments recently led Inside GNSS to produce its first supplement on the subject, Inside Unmanned Systems Magazine. And these same developments are the driving force behind this week's seminar series. So here's how Unmanned Systems Week will unfold. Today, four speakers will provide us with an overview on positioning, navigation, and guidance for unmanned systems. Then on Wednesday, June 4th, our webinar entitled GNSS Inertial Plus, Integration for Unmanned Systems, which is sponsored by Sensenor, will explore the positioning technologies that can be integrated with GNSS, as well as their implementation of platforms for use in various operational domains. And then finally, wrapping the series up on Friday, Unmanned Solutions and Applications Day, sponsored again by Novatel, will feature case studies of specific unmanned systems and their applications. So please sit back and get ready to enjoy today's webinar and thank you for joining us. And now it's time to introduce our moderator for today, Demos Gebrezogber. Demos is an associate professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Mechanics at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. His research there focuses primarily on design and analysis of integrated navigation and attitude determination systems for aerospace vehicles. Welcome, Demos. Thank you, Glenn, and uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar, the first of a series on unmanned systems. Before we get going here, we'd like to do a quick poll to get the pulse of the audience. So, Lori, if you'd uh, bring up poll number one. Absolutely, and, and folks, we'd like to hear from you. What application are you interested in using unmanned systems for? So it looks like we have 81% uh, saying air, 55% land, and 31% Marine. How does that stack up uh, against your expectations, Demos? Not surprising. I guess a lot of the applications uh, people are viewing are for air, but in today's webinar we'll talk a little bit more about marine, so let's uh, get going uh, to talking about what the webinar is all about today. So, uh, before I introduce the first panelist, let me 
uh, take a few minutes here to uh, set the uh, stage for what we're going to be talking about today. So first of all, unmanned vehicles are vehicles without a human operator on board. It doesn't mean that they can't be remotely operated, but it just means that there's a person, there isn't a person on board operating. They're being envisioned for use in all three domains, air, ground, and uh, marine. And they're being viewed for applications that uh, fit the so-called 3D categories, uh, dull, dangerous, and dirty. So with, for these systems to be able to do what they need to do, uh, they have to have a position, navigation, and timing solution that is integral to their guidance, navigation, and control system. And how good does the system have to be? Well, that depends on how you define what good is. And in the case of PNT, there are four metrics that are used for doing that. Uh, we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail later. But two things that I would like to emphasize, and you'll see this as we go through the webinar, is first of all, the PNT requirements are not uniform across uh, the domains or even in a given domain. Um, so for example, as you see on this first um, little graphic here, if you see a small um, uh, UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, doing precision, uh, precision agriculture applications. In this case, the important thing is to be able to determine the location of each corn stalk it's looking at, in which case the metric of accuracy becomes uh, the important metric by which we measure the performance of the PNT system. In the case of the second one shown here, it's a vehicle pl platooning uh, application. In this case, integrity becomes the more important or more driving requirement. It doesn't mean that the others are important as well, but it means that that's the key one. Uh, second thing that I want to get across, or that you will see coming across in this webinar, is that the requirements on PNT for unmanned systems can be as stringent, if not more so, than the requirements we're going to see in, uh, in manned vehicles. So the four metrics by which the performance of uh, uh, PNT systems are measured are availability, accuracy, integrity, and continuity. Uh, you could go look at this uh, slide after the webinar to see the more detailed definition of them. Since we don't have enough time in this webinar, today we're going to focus on just two of these metrics, availability and accuracy, and their relationship to the unmanned vehicle application. So with that, our goals for today's for webinar, the objectives are we want to answer these questions. Basically, we want to see what do these performance metrics mean with respect to unmanned systems, how are they measured, what are the solutions, software and hardware, that are used to achieve these. And after the first two panelists talk about those, the last panelist will talk about the last bullet, which is how are these specific PNT requirements achieved in air, land, and marine domains. And again, because we don't have the time, we'll just focus on one of them. In this case, we'll be looking at the marine application for unmanned systems. With that, let me go ahead and introduce our first panelist. And our first panelist is Sandy Kennedy, who is a, who's currently the Director and Chief Engineer of Core Cards at Novatel Inc. Her focus is overseeing the transformation of new and enhanced GNSS technologies into robust products for both commercial and military customers. Sandy helped launch the Synchronized Position, Attitude, and Navigation, or SPAN, product line in 2005. In 2013, she moved to the Core Card Group, taking on the role of Chief Engineer for Core Receiver Cards. Her primary motivation is bringing new positioning and navigation uh, capabilities to the market and to put their use to real-world applications. Sandy? Thanks, Demos. All right, so this, today I will be discussing availability requirements for unmanned systems. Let me just bring my slides up here. So we'll define solution availability as how often a position, velocity, and time solution is available. So how many epochs are you able to compute uh, position, velocity, and time solution from GNSS in this case? This could include an attitude solution as well. Now for an unmanned system, the requirement is typically always available in real time, so 100% available. Now it's not always possible with GNSS only, so that's one of the reasons that the Wednesday webinar is focusing on augmenting GNSS with other sensors like inertial. But just as a kind of a quick uh, recap on this, uh, with an unmanned system, it's really relying on its sensors and it needs to have a real-time indication of where it's at because it's essentially going blind for those epochs that it doesn't have a solution. And going blind for an unmanned system is not a good situation to be in, and GNSS is a very powerful tool. So we'll look at what we can do to try to fill in any of those or minimize the number of gaps that we have in our GNSS solution trajectory. 
So solution availability from GNSS is governed by a view of the sky, because that's where your satellites are, and the quality of signals that you're receiving from those satellites. So view of the sky means tracking at least four up there. Uh, but four really isn't a sufficient number to track to give you uh, a good solution. Uh, that's the very minimum number that you need if you're tracking a single constellation. And really, you need to have some redundant measurements so you can do some good quality control, um, some statistical analysis. You can be uh, choosy about which measurements you're selecting so you can reject measurements that have more errors than you wish to tolerate in your solution. Um, and one of that, that's what you want to be doing, but the part that you can't control necessarily is your view of the sky given what your application is. Uh, you may encounter obstructions and there's not really anything you can do about it because your unmanned system has a particular task to achieve and getting a position, velocity, time solution is sort of just an auxiliary necessity to go about what its actual job is. So what we can control is what satellites and what frequencies as well we're able to uh, support in our system. So tracking everything up there in terms of constellations and frequencies is the simplest approach to being able to maximize the number of epochs with a position solution. So in some situations, like an airborne situation that has pretty uh, flat and level uh, flight dynamics, GPS alone may be sufficient. But often it's not sufficient, even, uh, for example, if there's significant banking happening in your turns. And that's when you really need to move to GNSS and not just GPS. So GNSS today means GPS and GLONASS as fully operational systems, um, with Beidou coming online very quickly and Galileo coming along too. So by 2020, both Beidou and Galileo are expected to be fully operational. Beidou giving some indication that that might be brought into 2017. Uh, and we can focus on, but even today, GNSS is definitely reality and does offer some very good advantages for maximizing the number of times you have a position solution. So in North America, GPS plus GLONASS um, is an excellent way to be able to get that position computed in an urban canyon. Uh, GPS alone is often not sufficient in an urban canyon. Uh, so we've got you know, pretty much double the number of satellites up there when you're tracking GLONASS as well. You don't uh, have ideal positioning geometry out of this approach, but any position is better than no position most of the time, particularly if you have a reliable quality indicator that can tell you what um, if that position that you're getting is, you know, 20 centimeters accurate or is 2 meters accurate, if you can have a position quality indicator with that that you can rely upon, you're in a pretty good place for your system here. Now, depending on where you are, today in Asia, uh, GPS plus Beidou is a very viable option. Uh, Beidou coverage is currently quite good over Asia, and with their geostationary satellites that are part of the uh, constellation right now, they're very high elevation, and they are very valuable in these urban canyon type of situations here. So this graphic is showing the um, uh, sky plot of the satellite tracks from Beidou on the Gold Coast of Australia. So you can see there, um, they have a pretty good coverage, pretty useful, and if you're uh, actually in, you know, Asia proper, you see those figure eights living very close to Zenith there. So the other, uh, the other benefit of multi-constellation support is that you have choice. You have choice in your measurements. If you have a failure in one constellation, you have others to rely upon. And within each constellation, supporting dual or triple frequency uh, measurements increases the number of measurements available, especially when you've got a uh, completely independent, um, unencrypted uh, dual frequency available to you like you do on with Galileo and Beidou. And it also provides the opportunity for higher accuracy solutions by removing ionospheric errors when you have more than one frequency track. So with these more measurements, you can be much more selective in choosing which ones contribute to your solution and do a lot more statistical analysis of good and bad measurements. Now, with all things, oops, mistake there. <laughs> With all things, there's, there's a flip side to a benefit, um, and being able to track absolutely everything in view and every frequency of interest uh, in, can increase your interference susceptibility. So even if you did manage to maintain line of sight to a sufficient number of satellites, interference can render those signals in space inaccessible or useless to you. So how susceptible you are to interference really depends on how your receiver's been designed. 
uh, how wide are the RF and IF paths feeding into the tracking loops? Does GPS L1 share a path with GLONASS L1, or is GLONASS L1 completely separate? Meaning that if you had an interferer happening on GPS L1, will GLONASS L1 be basically immune to it in your receiver design? It also depends on what antenna that you're using, um, because your antenna is sort of the, the first entrance into your system, and if a frequency is supported by your antenna, it's going to hit the front end of your receiver for sure. So if you aren't using all the frequencies, uh, don't use a wideband antenna if you think interference is going to be a problem for you. Now, interference conditions on a UAV and it can be especially challenging, just as one example. Uh, UAVs are generally quite small, um, and they have a lot of electronics packed into a small area. So you can get a lot of self-interference going on uh, to your GNSS receiver card. There's usually other sensors on board that can be interference sources, like a radar sensor, and they usually have a telemetry system as well. And telemetry systems, uh, especially ones that are uh, quite robust and secure, um, can cause interference with your GNSS signals as well. So to recap what our frequency of interest looks like here, uh, top of your page here is uh, roughly we'll call it the L1 band, and down here is L2. So you can see uh, where the different constellations come in there. If it's labeled as B1, uh, it's they do L1, L2 is GPS, of course, and E1, uh, E5 there is um, a Galileo. So if you look at the bottom end of uh, your L1 area there, you can see that close to the uh, telemetry band that's been allocated. I've also added in the two um, frequency bands that light squared use because that will probably be in everybody's memory still as a threat that happened there. Um, on the right hand side you can see the upload frequencies for communication satellites and that right hand side there the upload frequencies are very very close to GLONASS L1 meaning that uh, if you are in an environment like in a marine environment where you're close to where an upload station is, you can definitely have interference coming in on GLONASS L1. And if you're looking at doing multi-constellation support, if you were to support just L1 in your receiver, or flip side of that, just B1 in your receiver, those are some of the narrowest frequency bands that you, can, um, that you could have to uh, acquire those uh, L1-like signals. Whereas if you're tracking everything all the way up to GLONASS L1, you've got a much wider band there and more opportunity for stuff to get in there. Um, on the lower side there, if you are tracking L-band corrections because you want a higher quality, of a higher accuracy solution, um, you've got the opportunity to receive those over L-band, uh, the MRSAT um, um, indications there. But you've also then given yourself some susceptibility depending on your, how your receiver is designed to track that. And then moving over to the, uh, the lower band there, the L2 band, radar hangs out just on the lower side, on the left-hand side there. Um, you can definitely have some, some things bleed over 1150 into GPS L5. So GPS L5 right now, eh, there's not so many satellites up there. So if you're designing a system for use to run right now, you may not value the support of L5. Um, in terms of what the balance is for you, in terms of where you might have interference and how sensitive you are to it. Um, the other threat on this band is over from amateur radio allocation up on the upper right side of GLONASS L2 there. And you'll see that it's also very, very close to B3 and uh, well, actually overlapping B3 and E6 there as well. So again, you can have a receiver designed to support B3 and uh, E6 in preparation for the future. Um, but depending where you're at, that may be more of a risk to you than a benefit. So as I mentioned before, your first entry into your system is your antenna. So sometimes you have unavoidable interference, and that is intentional jamming. So in this case, you may consider an anti-jam antenna. And one type of anti-jam antenna is a null steering antenna. So what a null steering antenna does is it basically uh, well, it nulls out, it zeroes out the gain pattern of the antenna. So if there's a jammer over here in this direction, it basically just doesn't listen to it. It uh, modifies its antenna gain pattern on the fly, and uh, just that's how it blocks out the signals coming from the jammer. 
So uh, if you have uh, n antenna elements, you can block out up to n minus 1 jammers. So the picture here is an example of an anti-jam antenna. This is Novotel's gadget antenna. And this has seven elements in it, so it can handle up to six jammers. Now, it is a fairly large antenna, and not every application can bear the, the, the weight and sometimes the cost of a specifically designed anti-jam antenna. Um, anti-jam antennas can also come with some export control as well. So if this isn't an option for you, then you need to rely on your receiver design. So your receiver design um, uh, definitely uh, comes into how those signals are tracked. So partly with a narrow band design and independent signal tracking is uh, one of the easiest ways to do it or the most straightforward way to do it. It allows you to turn off your problem frequencies if you can detect where your jammer is. Um, and then you can move on to more sophisticated techniques like digital filtering, provided that you haven't been saturated all the way from your antenna. And one of the areas that is uh, sort of a balance, again, between um, availability of signals and accuracy of those signals um, is a multipath effect. The multipath is often a dominant error source, especially in an urban area, and it can come into play with um, applications that appear to be fairly open sky, but then have an approach situation for them. So something like a mining vehicle coming close to a pit wall or a small craft refueling from a large tanker. So you know, when we're trying to maximize the number of measurements that we can make, uh, you know, this is where often you end up with a high sensitivity receiver design. But in this case, you are picking up absolutely everything, including uh, highly multipath signals. So if you're in a GNSS-only sense, it can be difficult to identify and remove or adequately de-weight those multipath measurements. And also direct reflected signals are especially hard to detect. So now in this case, again, your antenna design is, uh, can be key to your multipath performance, what type of antenna you choose. Again, um, if you've got something that is a fairly uh, level application, so not a lot of heaving and rolling, uh, it's a uh, good practice to choose an antenna that um, doesn't have a very high gain below the horizon, so basically doesn't have a sensitive underbelly that um, signals can bounce up into. After that, your next line of defense is your correlator used in the receiver. So receivers with a narrow correlator or a pack correlator, sometimes called a strobe correlator as well, will give you a very different, um, uh, well, give you good multipath control compared to a receiver that is not deploying a sophisticated correlator technique in it. So to wrap up, to protect your GNSS solution availability, track the signals that are valuable to you. And really, which ones are valuable to you? What are you able to use effectively in your solution? And protect those signals that you're using. It could be through shielding, like actually putting your receiver card in a, in a can, so to speak, uh, to protect it from interference um, within the vehicle. Uh, select your receiver uh, radio frequency design quite carefully. Uh, ask questions about how it's going to perform, um, what kind of uh, interference susceptibility is there, and choose your antenna carefully as well. Choose something that uh, meets your needs, but sometimes the extra isn't necessarily extra for you if you aren't using signals um, in the full band that the antenna supports. And that concludes my slide, so I will turn it back to you, Demo. Thank you, Sandy. All right, so uh, at this point, we'd like to take a short pause for some uh, questions and answers. Uh, and so if you have questions, please uh, send them to us, and uh, we'll direct them to the, uh, to the panelists here. So to start off, uh, let's see, this first question is going to be for you, Sandy. Um, and it uh, has to do with redundancy of the signal in space. You've discussed uh, methods for increasing the availability by using different uh, GNSSs. Uh, what about hardware failures? Do your receivers uh, track multiple? Do receivers that track multiple constellations also have redundant hardware in them? Right. So most receivers that track multiple constellations do not have redundant hardware in them. So uh, again, like I mentioned, it depends on their design exactly how many paths there are into the receiver and, and how that's been separated out. Um, but hardware failures, I mean, honestly, the most common hardware failure failure is typically cabling. <laughs> it's, uh, it's somebody having a bad connection between their antenna and their receiver. Uh, for hardware failures on board a GNSS receiver, those are actually quite low now with uh, like a 
sort of a professional grade receiver for sure. Um, so in terms of which hardware you think might fail in there, most of it's in the similar, the most of there is sort of sharing between the two of them. So redundant hardware often means redundant complete receiver cards. So two or more receiver cards used. All right. Um, anything you would want to see you could add to that, uh, Andre or Stephen? No, I think it was pretty complete. Yeah, but I, I would agree with that. Okay. Great. All right, so question number two. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me uh, direct this one at Steve. Um, and in your experience of integrating GNSS receiver in the John Man systems or systems in general, um, uh, is it one size fits all or does, it, does each vehicle in a given class require tuning? Uh, is that something that the user can do or is that something that uh, you uh, as a supplier would do? Well, uh, the, 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 the sensible approach is actually to have a system capable of, uh, of many types of operations. So it's capability. In, in the marine environment where you're, you're talking um, a very expensive vessel, uh, the cost of having a GNSS system capable of doing all types of operations is, is minuscule compared to the overall cost. So you generally have a system that is capable of doing everything. It's not one size fits all because you can augment it as needed and when needed for a specific mission role. Uh, it's the best way to go about it is be able to just design in full capability into the system. All right. Uh, anything you'd uh, care to add to that, uh, Sandy? Uh, no, I don't think so at this time. All right. All right. So let's see. Here is a question for, um, I guess this one I'll direct for you, Sandy, and it has to do with uh, sure. The advantages of GNSS uh, GPS GLONASS integration. Uh, the question is: Did you uh, can you quantify or can you say something about uh, the GPS GLONASS integration for urban canyons? Can you talk about uh, how much it increases availability and multipath uh, rejection at all? Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is something that we've tested quite a bit. Um, it often comes in with testing uh, Novatel's G GNSS. Uh, INS systems, our SPAN systems. So we do a lot of data collection in urban canyon situations, in North America especially, not as much in, in Europe. Um, but I mean, it's a similar latitude and a similar constellation coverage there. Um, so it does depend a little bit specifically on what your urban canyon looks like and exactly the time of day. But typically, if you're supporting GLONASS as well as GPS, you're going to see oh, often a 50% improvement in the number of epochs, meaning that that you have a solution, meaning that you know you might have with GPS only only 30% of the time you actually were able to have a position solution, uh, whereas if you have GPS GLONASS, that often gets boosted up to you know 75% of the time, depending on how severe that urban canyon um, is. Now, in terms of multipath, um, there isn't a real big difference in terms of um, what type of multipath you suffer from GPS uh, versus on a GLONASS signal. Um, again, in this case, uh, for sure, it's your antenna choice as well as um, your correlator that's used in your receiver. So your antenna choice, if you're in an urban canyon, you're usually pretty flat level. <laughs> you're not usually doing anything in a land vehicle that's going to have severe banking in an urban canyon. Uh, so in that case, yeah, definitely pick in a, a high-quality antenna. Uh, some people are limited to something very small like a patch antenna to, um, for their application. Um, and then again, with this number of signals, you can uh, start um, um, doing more RAIM-like methods for rejecting um, severely multipath signals. Again, depending on what your actual urban canyon is like, um, your direct reflected may be better or worse. If everything's got very um, nice reflective signals or if there's more brick and uh, stone uh, and it's more um, absorbed, well, not as bad for bounces, basically. So yeah, to sum up, GLONASS is very good and very useful in an urban canyon situation. All right. Thank you, Sandy. All right. So we're going to have a second Q&A session later on. So if you haven't answered your questions that you sent in now, don't worry. We'll have a second chance at it later on. So let's move on and let me introduce our next uh, uh, panelist. But before I do that, let's do a quick uh, poll, a uh, second poll here. Lori, if you could put up the poll. Absolutely. Uh, on your screen, you should see that second poll. In which of the following IMAN system operating domains are the PNT requirements most 
stringent. In this case, go ahead and select one. Is it air, land, marine? Or maybe it depends on the operation. So we have 31% uh, of us saying air, 12% saying la land, 4% saying marine, and then um, the majority there, 53% of us saying it depends on the operation. Uh, Demos, any thoughts? All right. I mean, it's good to see that there's quite a bit of uh, individuals that say it depends on the operation, and it will become pretty clear on the next uh, panelist presentation that that's indeed uh, really the case. So with that, let me go ahead and uh, introduce our next panelist. Our next panelist is Dr. Andrei Slofiev, who is the president of uh, QNAV, and R &D, that's an R&D business enterprise. Uh, previously, he served as a research faculty at the University of Florida and as a senior research engineer at the Ohio University uh, Avionics Engineering Center. He has authored or co-authored more than 80 navigation-related publications. Uh, Dr. Solosiev's research interests are in the area of sensor fusion and signal processing for navigation. Andre? Thank you, Demos. So I'll talk about the accuracy requirements for unmanned systems. And specifically, I'll give you some examples of what accuracy requirements are out there. And then we'll talk about GNSS techniques that are generally applied to achieve those requirements. So uh, in terms of the accuracy requirements, I just put some uh, you know, examples on this slide here to illustrate the point, And it's related to the previous poll, that it's, when we're talking about unmanned systems, it's really difficult to come up with a general set of requirements that would fit every application. So really, when we're talking about the accuracy, then the accuracy requirements, they do depend on specific application we're talking about. So for example, here, precision agriculture, probably one of the most demanding requirements in terms of the accuracy. So when you, for example, implement an automated steering of your tractor or combine, Generally, there's a centimeter level of accuracy that is required to support this operation. Autonomous driving, uh, Google cars, or platooning, uh, accuracy should be a decimeter level to enable autonomous driving for these applications. For UAVs, it's really unmanned aerial because it really, again, depends on specific application. Uh, but when we're talking about flying your aerial vehicle through certain waypoints in a relatively open area, then meter level accuracy is generally OK. Uh, autonomous marine vessels, uh, the accuracy requirements are in the range from 10 centimeters to 2 meters. In terms of gen genesis positioning techniques, so basically I put four probably most popular techniques on this slide in the table. And we'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes how these techniques are actually implemented. Uh, so we have the techniques here and the typical accuracies that can be achieved using those techniques. So the first one is just a standalone genesis solution. And there you can expect an accuracy at the level of 10 meters. When we go from a standalone solution to satellite-based augmentation systems, when differential corrections are sent through a dedicated satellite link, then the accuracy improves quite a bit, basically by an order of magnitude, and goes to a meter level. Then there's a technique called precise point positioning. And I'll talk again how it's actually implemented about the main principles. that actually enables decimeter to submeter level of accuracy. And finally, from the accuracy perspective, the ultimate solution is the real-time kinematic differential solution that enables centimeter level, or even better, sub-centimeter level of accuracy. As Sandy was talking, uh, generally when we're uh, talking about the GNSS, it can meet accuracy requirements when adequate satellite geometry is available and you have enough satellites. And generally that means when you're in an open area like this example here, GNSS can provide you sufficient accuracy. However, if you go into what we call GNSS degraded or GNSS challenged environment, or in some cases GNSS denied, such as an urban example here, then it becomes really difficult to maintain the requirement, the required accuracy based on GNSS alone. So we'll talk about argumentation with other sensors on Wednesday, how GNSS can be improved to enable operations of autonomous vehicles in this type of environments. So let's talk about um, our main positioning techniques. And I'll start with a standalone solution. So what you have here, you have a GNSS receiver. And you get your pseudo range and carry phase measurements from the receiver tracking loops. Well, the first thing you probably want to do, you want to smooth your pseudo ranges with the carry phase, just to 
reduce the level of noise and multipath in pseudo range measurements. And then you apply a classic triangulation based on carry smooth pseudo ranges. Generally, it's implemented in the form of least mean square position estimation. And I think most of the people in the audience are familiar with this triangulation least mean square estimation approach. So I'm not going to spend too much time here. So the second step, and again, as I mentioned before, the standalone solution, it depending on, um, you know, on, on the type of errors you're dealing with, specifically atmospheric errors such as Iono and Tropo, but generally it would enable you the accuracy at a level of 10 meters, which is relatively limited when we're talking about applications of Genesis positioning for unmanned systems, unmanned vehicles. So the next step in terms of the accuracy is a satellite-based argumentation system, so ASBAS. So you basically keep all the components of your standalone solution and you add corrections of your pseudo range measurements based on systems such as WAS or Agnes where differential corrections, corrections for errors in satellite clocks and orbits and also atmospheric delays are sent to the receiver through a dedicated satellite communication link. So you implement those corrections and the accuracy improves through the level of meters really in between a one and two meters. That's what you can expect from an ASBAS system. Uh, the next positioning techniques, which, which is fairly interesting, I think, it's called the precise point positioning. So basically it relies on the availability of satellite orbit and clock corrections from publicly available free services such as International Genesis Service, IGS. So the idea here is to use those corrections, which are one of the uh, and correct for satellite orbit and clock errors, to one, one of the uh, most prominent errors in the Genesis Aero budget, and use ionic corrections uh, from dual frequency receiver or from SBAS. And for the tropo, you can apply a tropospheric model. And of course, if there's a tropo storm or some weather going on, it's probably not going to be very efficient. But that's what you use for corrections. And you estimate your position, not from pseudo ranges, but from the carry phase. Pseudo ranges you use for the initialization of the position solution, but the main estimation is performed based on the carry phase. So this is how it works. Uh, this is the carry phase measurement equation on this slide. So you basically you have your carry phase, your measured carry phase, and it's expressed as a true range, which is a projection of your position on the satellite, on the receiver to satellite line of sight unit vector. Then you have residual adjustment error, which includes uncompensated TROP or uh, uncompensated IONO, and maybe some residual satellite orbit and clock error terms, and integer ambiguities in the carry phase. And also you have noise and multipath. So you input this measurement as a measurement observable to the common filter that is trying to separate this position term and the bias term but observing, by observing carry phase measurements from multiple satellites over time. So what's going on here, basically the bias term, assuming that all your residual errors are fairly constant, will remain constant over time. But the position related term will change because the line of sight vectors to the satellites will change over time. So you observe these carry phase measurements over time and you estimate position based on those observations. And again, uh, depending on the accuracy of your corrections, uh, that are available to you, you can achieve a decimeter to a submeter level of accuracy doing precise point positioning approach. Finally, uh, from the positioning point of view, there's a real-time kinematic solution. And it's a relative differential solution where you have a base receiver, you have a rubber receiver. First thing you do, you do double differencing to compensate common errors. And then you have double difference ranges and double difference carry phase. You still need to do code carry smoothing again to reduce the level of noise and multipath errors in your range measurements. And then from uh, double difference carry smoothed code, you have a float solution, initial solution, and then you resolve into J ambiguities based on some standard methods, a mature ambiguity resolution methods such as Lambda, which was developed by Delft University and has been proven to work fairly reliably for the RTK type of solution. Again, uh, when we're talking about the RTK, in terms of the accuracy, you can assume a centimeter level of accuracy, or even better in some cases. But when we're talking about autonomous vehicles, 
it's not just about positioning. When we talk about GNSS accuracy, really what, you know, mostly we're talking about positioning accuracy. But for autonomous vehicle applications, the important point is just not the only positioning accuracy that we are interested in. Uh, there's an aspect of trajectory control. Your autopilot needs to have some other motion states other than position. And there's also trajectory capture. I'll give you an example just in a few seconds, where other motion states other than just position are also important for the specific application you're considering. And these other motion states generally include velocity, acceleration, and attitude. Similar to positioning, uh, accuracy requirements are very application specific. So I put an example here where you georeferencing uh, points of interest for precision agriculture or for some other purposes uh, based on autonomous aerial vehicles. So in this case, the attitude requirements are quite important and the attitude accuracy that you're interested in actually depends on the UAV mission. For example, if you're interested in a one meter position accuracy for your georeferencing, and you're flying at a 100 meter height, then you're okay uh, with the attitude accuracy level of 10 milliradians, or one degree approximately. However, if your height increases from 100 meters to one kilometer, then your attitude accuracy needs to improve by an order of magnitude. So now we're not talking about 10 milliradian level, we're talking about one milliradian level, which is quite challenging uh, to achieve based on GNSS alone. Now let's talk about techniques for estimation of other motion states other than position, uh, specifically velocity and attitude. Uh, this slide summarizes the velocity estimation approaches. And there are three possible approaches. Uh, the first two, and they're sort of uh, not really traditional, but probably a little bit more known than the third one. So I'll start with the first two. And the first method is, is, is pretty straightforward. You just get velocity by difference in your position over time. Uh, the second approach, you use Doppler frequency and doing the least mean square solution for velocity, very similar to the triangulation for positioning. So these two approaches, position, difference, in, or use of the Doppler frequency, provide you with a sub-decimeter per second accurate velocity. There's a third approach, which actually enables improving the accuracy to a sub-centimeter per second level. And this is estimating velocity from temporal changes in the carry phase. Again, using the carry phase for all the estimation, generally your accuracy improves quite a bit. So this is how it works in uh, general conceptual terms for the estimation of velocity from the carry phase. So you have your traditional carry phase measurement equation, which is the true range from your receiver to the satellite. There's an ambiguity term, there's a clock bias term, atmospheric delays and SV clock errors, and there's a noise and multipath. So what you do, you difference this carry phase measurement over time, basically to get rid of integer ambiguities. The temporal difference of the carry phase is related to the change in the delta position between carry phase update, successive carry phase updates. And there's also a satellite motion term which can be compensated based on the families. Uh, and basically, using this temporal difference carry phase, you can estimate velocity. The first step, you estimate delta position, and then you can estimate velocity from this very accurate, sub-centimeter accurate delta position measurements by just fitting polynomials. So uh, just to give you an example of the velocity estimation accuracy, here are some example flight test results. There's a flight trajectory with multiple circles, so it's a pretty high dynamic flight environments and velocity estimation errors, uh, east velocity and north velocity estimation accuracy. So for the east velocity, you have standard deviation of the estimation error at level of 2.6 millimeters per second. And for the north velocity, the estimation error is 3.7 millimeters per second. So you just see in this example how accurate the velocity estimation can be when you're using the carry phase for the velocity estimation. Uh, finally, I'd like to talk about the Genesis attitude estimation. Again, for some applications such as georeferencing, for example, attitude can be actually more important than the positioning accuracy. So when we're talking about Genesis attitude estimation alone, we need to use multiple antennas. So the general approach here, how you define the attitude, you basically need to know at least two vectors. You need to know components of those vectors to resolve 
in the body frame of reference and in the navigation frame of reference. Then you can find the rotation that aligns components of these two vectors in the body frame with their components in the navigation frame. And the reason you need to know two vectors is because if you only have one and you find the rotation that aligns components of this one vector in the body frame and nav frame, there is still a rotational degree of freedom. You basically rotate your body frame around that one vector and its components don't change. So you need the second vector to completely fix your attitude. So for the GNSS, what it means, you need to have at least three antennas. And then the first step you do, uh, you do the double difference RTK solution to figure out what are the components of these three vectors in the navigation frame. In the body frame, you just pre-measure them and know them beforehand. So once you have these three vectors resolved in the body frame and the navigation frame, you do the attitude estimation. You find the rotation that aligns components of these two vectors in the body frame and navigation frame, and from this rotation, you can estimate your all pitch and heading angles. In terms of the attitude accuracy, it really depends on the size of your multi-antenna system and basically size of your autonomous vehicles where you can find, where you can mount those antennas. Uh, the position estimation accuracy for these three vectors is the centimeter level, maybe sub-centimeter level. But when we're going from position to the attitude, you need to divide this position accuracy over the size of the multi-antenna system. So if you have a pretty large system, say 10 meters, then you can see you have one centimeter, 10 meters, you can achieve a milliradian type of accuracy. However, if your size of your system is pretty limited for small size autonomous platforms, then uh, it may be not very efficient to determine attitude based on the GSS loan, and you may want to consider augmentation with inertial or other sensors for this purpose. And we'll talk about it more, the GSS augmentation with other sensors on our, during our Wednesday webinar. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Demos. Thank you, Andre. All right, so uh, you, again, in the audience, if you have questions for Andre, send them in, and we'll get to them at the last Q&A session. In the meantime, let me introduce our third panelist, who is Stephen Brown. He is the Executive Vice President for Commercial uh, for uh, Veripaws, uh, based in Houston, Texas, and Aberdeen, Scotland. He has over 35 years of experience working in the marine navigation and positioning business as a field engineer, technical manager, business development manager, regional general manager, and regional vice president. He has served as the chairman of the Houston chapter of the Institute of Navigation and of the Houston chapter of the Hydrographic Society of America. He's currently on the Marine Technology Society Dynamic Positioning Committee and serves as the MTS Dynamic Positioning Conference Chairman. With that, Stephen. Thank you, Demos. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in this webinar. I'll be speaking today about uh, some of the current and future practical requirements and considerations for DG and SS positioning on UMVs. These requirements are basically the same as for manned vessels, but some of the challenges to be addressed are exaggerated when comparing a, a small UMV, a few meters in size, to other offshore vessels that can be hundreds of meters long. There are a limited number of uh, production UMVs currently operating. The, uh, the, the concept is in development, I would say, and it will likely embrace a multi-role capability with modular sensor packages allowing UMVs to be configured for mission-specific roles. Obviously, for the military, uh, some of those roles would be harbor security, mine warfare, mine countermeasures, hydrographic survey, littoral warfare, especially in the amphibious operations. Um, marine and airborne gunnery training targets. Um, many of the systems uh, developed for the military will be false force multipliers, much like AUVs are today. In the offshore oil and gas business, uh, hydrographic survey, including seafloor mapping, pipeline route surveys, hazard surveys, uh, those will be some of the missions. Touchdown monitoring for pipeline vessels, there's currently an operation ongoing in the Gulf of Mexico using a UMV doing that. Med ocean operations and uh, pollution detection and response are two other missions in the oil and gas business you might see. The scientific and governmental missions are pretty similar to the others, hydrographic surveys, oceanographic surveys, pollution monitoring and fishery operations, and probably quite a few I haven't uh, thought of as well. Well, to be three types of UMVs in operation, unmanned but remotely controlled, unmanned and autonomous, and combined remote control and autonomous. 
all three types will have the same general DGNSS requirements. The different UMV missions will have different GAS requirements, for example, absolute accuracy for hydrographic survey type missions, or stable and robust position for station keeping operations. All operations will need to address the prevention of single point failures, as this is of paramount importance in the marine industry. Most offshore requirements will include the need for high accuracy PPP DGNSS solutions, plus or minus 10 centimeters, with a standard DGNSS solution as backup. The highly dynamic and harsh marine environment requires waterproof housings and systems capable of withstanding high G-forces and heavy seas. Cable connections must be similar to what are found on ROVs and other marine systems, waterproof and rugged. Position outputs will be required for a remote operator, monitor, and or tracking systems via multiple link, multiple platform data communication systems that utilize satellite, UHF, unlicensed broadband systems. Um, there will need to be also capability of outputting position to onboard dynamic positioning and navigation systems or DP systems for autonomous unmanned marine vessels. Integrated DGNSS and INS systems seem to be a natural fit for UMVs. GNSS issues and challenges that currently require consideration and mitigation on a UMV will likely be similar to a variety of marine vessels, but more difficult to mitigate for than most manned vessels. The photo in the top right corner up here uh, illustrates the sort of multi-path blockage and interference issues manned vessels currently deal with. These issues would obviously be magnified on a smaller UMV, but if you could imagine a platform as shown there with a very large vessel next to it still manages to shadow much of the GNSS horizon for that vessel, and plus there are multiple transmitters on that platform which can cause interference problems with the GNSS systems on the vessel. The photo in the lower left provides a picture of the dynamic environment, such as high-speed craft contending with rough seas. Obviously, the seas in this picture are, are not so rough, but if you could imagine a, a slightly heavier sea, how much more pitch and roll and heave that vessel would be experiencing. Well, as previously stated, uh, UMVs will likely have more issues with multipath than standard marine operations due to the height of the antenna above the surface, typically only a few meters as compared to the 30 to 150 meter antenna height range on manned marine vessels. Also, multipath from being alongside large offshore platforms as in the previous slide or other vessels or harbor structures will be exaggerated. The dynamic range of motion to the, due to the pitch and roll and heave on a smaller vessel like a UMV is far greater than on a larger vessel and will have a negative impact on the position output to the DP system due to the rapidly changing GNSS constellation elevations and in high latitude operations can also affect the corrections link where geosynchronous communication satellites will be at low elevations near the vessel horizon. Again, these challenges provide an argument for an integrated INS DGNSS solution. Given limited mast area and small vessel design, there will be mounting location and environmental conditions potentially requiring a, a pod system which integrates a DGNSS receiver and antenna into a single waterproof and shock resistant housing. Uh, that's one direction you can go in in, in designing your, your GNSS requirement for an unmanned vessel. Whichever way you go, whether separate receivers or a pod system, receivers must be capable of multi-constellation, multi-frequency operations and able to utilize multiple correction services such as Veripaz Ultra or Apex Commercial Services or free services such as IALA, SPAS or the Petrobras UHF DGNSS service which is an operation in the Campos phase in offshore Brazil. Receivers should also be RTK capable for nearshore and harbor missions. Selection of antenna type will require study as to whether a combined or separate GNSS L-band corrections antenna is preferable, whether a patch or helical antenna will provide the best performance, and game pattern considerations will be an important criteria to deal with dynamic antenna movement and multipath issues. Antenna models with tight notch filters capable of limiting in-band interference and eliminating out-band interference will be required. Uh, you would, in Sandy's in the first presentation Sandy gave, you'll see there's a, a picture here as well, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't by design. We both came to the opinion that this type of antenna might be uh, appropriate for this operation. Typical causes of interference uh, being experienced offshore marine can be categorized as in-band 
or outbound interference. The typical causes of inband interference in the marine environment typically are other DNSS receivers where there is a faulty antenna, antenna cable or bad connection caused by water ingress or poor shielding causing the local oscillator to re-radiate and cause loss of lock in GNSS receivers. Communication systems using GNSS for orientation or position such as MRSAT B, MRSAT C, BGAN, uh, VI, a, excuse me, AIS systems or vessel ident automatic identification systems can also cause problems and use GNSS as well. Precision timing systems for survey sensors can also uh, cause some interference issues. Some of the causes of outband interference in the marine environment are radar systems, telemetry and communication systems, and by transmission sources on other vessels and offshore platforms. The picture of the mast over here in the lower left corner shows 22 different potential sources of interference. Given the need for a robust data link system on a UMV, the most likely cause of interference will come from onboard communication systems, but everything has to be considered in the design of your system. Given the uh, receiver technology and antenna type mounting location could mitigate some of the aforementioned interference sources, but as mentioned in the previous slides, UMV will likely have limited antenna location options so thorough EMI planning and testing will need to be conducted as part of the design phase. A hydrographic survey using a multi-beam sonar will want absolute accuracy and repeatability for return to position at a later date. So some operations will require accuracy. A station keeping operations will require position stability and robustness, the ability to hold position in most environmental conditions such as sea state, wind, current, and in both good and poor GNSS conditions, whether there's poor satellite geometry, scintillation, correction satellite blockage, GNSS SV, satellite, uh, SV blockage, variable geometry, all of these things uh, create an ideal environment for an integrated DGNSS and INS solution. And given the multi-role nature and potential of UMVs, a system capable of using all types of corrections, including commercial corrections, is required. And remember that these vessels operating in marine environments, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. You will be using these in many different locations around the globe where some services are available and some aren't. So you have to design the system for global availability as much as possible. Prevention of single point failures, as in other criteria, other missions, uh, whether they're airborne or land, um, it's of paramount importance in the marine industry. For the prevention of single point failures, GNSS systems will need to have fully redundant and independent systems. They'll have to be multi, have multi constellation capability utilizing GPS, GLONASS, and all future systems to maximize satellite availability. They'll need to have multiple correction sources, including commercial services via L band satellite link, including N trip corrections via COM satellites. Um, they'll be able, they must be able to utilize terrestrial broadcast correction services such as Ayala Marine Radio Beacon Services or Petrobras UHF DGNS Network. They'll be able to utilize all SBAS services and also have RTK capability for nearshore operations. Integration of INS and DGNSS such as a Novotel span system to mitigate for several issues like antenna blockage, scintillation, vessel motion um, would be a preferable way to go. Independent power sources if it's possible, but probably not likely on a, on a UMB, but certainly independent UPS systems for the GNSS system would be a good idea. Differential and complementary systems and system components such as antenna types, allowing for variable environmental conditions. Um, one antenna type might be more affected by interference than another, but that antenna type is better for your uh, multipath. Uh, therefore, you want to probably be picked possibly might want to pick uh, two different types of antennas to utilize on one of these small vessels. And at least one system should be set to operate in single constellation mode as issues in one GNSS system can affect the position integrity of a second working GNSS system where a combined solution of the two merged constellations is used. This recently occurred with GLONASS where the problems experienced with the GLONASS constellations uh, or the GLONASS availability um, upset a uh, position on offshore vessels. Uh, having one system set on GPS only would be a good way to counter uh, such an incident if it happened again. 
And this final diagram is just one sort of uh, idea for a uh, redundant multi-link DG and SS system, which would address most of the challenges I raised in the previous slides. However, this is only one. There's a dozen I could have put in here. But uh, just using this one to kind of illustrate what we have and how we would design for this type of environment. You would have a standalone DG, DG and SS system capable of utilizing all forms of, of corrections out there, uh, whether they're commercial corrections or whether they're IALA or SBAS or something like the Petrobras UHF system. But the idea here is that this primary system can utilize all sources of corrections. Then you would have redundant INS systems, a uh, couple of Novotel span units here. They have integrated GNSS receivers in them. They would also utilize commercial corrections as well as other sources. And then you have an NTRIP system, uh, an ILAN connected up to your satellite communication system and distributing corrections, backup corrections via NTRIP to both the Novotel span systems and the Veripause receiver shown here. All of these systems would output both to communication systems, which would be linked to a remote operator slash monitors location, and would also output position data into the uh, onboard DP and navigation system. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and that concludes the presentation, and I'll hand it back to Demos now. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right, so on this slide, we have some uh, slides and references, so you could uh, take a look at those. But before we go on to the final uh, references to the slides, uh, before we go to the final Q&A, uh, a couple of points. Uh, one, uh, the uh, PDF of this presentation will be available at the Inside NSS uh, website after the uh, webinar. Two, I encourage you to actually register and uh, attend the two other uh, webinars on manned systems this week. And lastly, we have contact info for our panelists and our sponsor here at the bottom of the slide, which you can use if you have uh, further questions. All right, so before we go to the last Q&A session, we have one more poll. So, Lori, if you could bring that poll up. Sure will. On the screen, we have our final poll for today. If all regulatory framework is in place, when do you see yourself using unmanned systems? Pretty even spread there, 28% uh, saying one year, 23% two years, 24% three years, uh, just 6% saying four years, and 19% saying five years. So kind of interesting data, uh, wouldn't you say, Demos? Yes, and again, kind of looks uh, that there's a lot of current interest in, uh, in using these unmanned systems. It's just one year out from now. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and move to the uh, uh, Q&A. So questions for our panelists. So this first question is going to be for you, Andre. Um, and uh, it's uh, basically it says all the methods that you talked about for PNG on man systems are, are, I guess, the way you presented them are real-time systems, uh, real-time solutions. Can you say something about post-processing uh, GNSS solution with uh, other information that may be gained from the vehicle and combined with information on the ground? Sure, yeah. Uh, remember, though, when we're talking about autonomous vehicles, uh, there are generally two types of tasks in terms of the navigation solution where you want to use it. Uh, one is trajectory control. And for trajectory control, you cannot, by definition, you know, defer to post-processing solution because you have to provide the information to your autopilot in real time. I mean, you cannot do it post-processing. The vehicle has to fly right now. So, uh, but if, you, if you're interested in uh, using the post-processing solutions such as, uh, you know, you want to do your RTK in post-processing for trajectory capture or, uh, you know, maybe you want to uh, figure out the attitude combined with inertial sensors for trajectory capture, then, then it, it's, it's possible and maybe more, um, you know, more beneficial to operate in this way because there are some methods that, that are you know, some batch processing methods uh, such a, that are more efficient uh, when you apply them in post processing. So I think it's 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 viable, but when you're talking about trajectory capture, not trajectory control. Uh, Sandy or Steve, any comments on any uses for post processing in this kind of an application that you may add to add on? No, I don't have anything to add. 
All right, so second question. Yeah, let's see. Uh, this one is for you, uh, uh, Steve. It's, uh, I'm pretty sure, I think you may have dealt with this issue, but for unmanned vehicles, no close reflectors, do you think multipath is as serious as uh, for land unmanned vehicles? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you just think this, the water surface is an excellent reflector of the uh, GNSS signal, so multipath will always be an issue. And then when you consider the fact that on a small vessel, even with nothing around to uh, create any additional multipath problems, you get variable C states, and those variable C states will affect your multipath quite a bit. All right. Next question. This one is for uh, Sandy, um, and it, it has to do with ionospheric effects. Is there anything special you do with unmanned vehicles or unique about them, or can you say something about uh, ionospheric effects uh, with respect to unmanned vehicles? Uh, sure. I mean, really, ionospheric effects on unmanned systems isn't really any different than ionospheric effects in any other application. Again, it depends what type of uh, solution you're using. If you're using a pseudo-range only solution and you're in single point mode, so you don't have any differential corrections happening or anything like that, um, ionospheric effects aren't as serious or there's less that you can do about them. Um, ionospheric effects, when you're trying to do a more precise solution, something that's down to the decimeter level, for sure, affects it the same way as it would in any other situation. So the longer your baseline with RTK, the more those ionospheric effects are not being canceled out. If you're trying to do a PPP solution, then yeah, absolutely, you need to have uh, ionospheric correction included in your, in your system. Um, yeah, so nothing really particularly specific about it, but um, just depends on whether you're going for that meter level solution or whether you're going for that centimeter level solution. Right. All right. Uh, this one is for Andre, um, and it is a, a question on what is the difference between using Doppler and differentiating carrier phase to compute velocity? Uh, are the two the same, or are they different sides of the same coin? Uh, can you say something about that? They're not the same. I mean, they obviously are related, but um, carry phase, when you're doing the carry tracking loop, you specifically track carry phase. So carry phase is not uh, necessarily your integrated Doppler when you just integrate it directly. So it's, it's, it's a separate measurement that you make, and it's generally uh, the most accurate measurement in the GSS receiver. So that's, in my opinion, that's why you want to use it when you can. So. All right. Um, anything uh, either Sandy or Stephen you want to add to that one? No, I'm okay from my end. All right. I think Andre covered it. Okay. All right. Yep, I think it's well covered. All right. This next one is uh, for you, Sandy. Uh, and regarding interference mitigation, you mentioned dual filtering. How do you feel the industry is progressing in, in this direction and adapting techniques for uh, doing this in the UAS environment? Is this level of sophistication, in your opinion, beyond what a practical UAS user would need or would want? Right. Okay. So um, how the industry is progressing on adopting this? So what's provided in a commercial product is very much dependent on what there is customer demand for and specific customer demand for. And a lot of users um, still view interference as, a, as an if and a, a maybe and ah, that's a remote chance of it happening. Um, so that's one thing that drives how much is actually in a fielded product, like actually in production in sort of standard product. Um, and it depends. Like in the past, um, it hasn't. It has been an if, uh, an if kind of uh, a risk, not a an insurable when <laughs> it's going to happen. Um, so often, uh, what can happen is that there's an easier solution to it. So digital filtering for sure can work, um, but you know there's a bit more kind of configuration that happens with it. And often, a simple hardware solution is a more reliable and faster way to a solution. So for example, you know, you might be, a lot of people right now just limit the system to the frequencies of interest. And so far, frequencies of interest have been enough, they've been protected, they've been safe. Um, and probably it's often easier to put a shield around your card than it is to try to remove uh, that sort of interference effect in filtering. Um, so there is a balance of what's practical in terms of how is it configured, how reliably does it have to um, occur, um, are you dealing with interference that's moving around, are you dealing with the same interference over and over again. 
So it's something that I think will become a lot more prominent in the future, uh, especially as our frequent our spectrum gets more and more crowded, um, and you have more wireless things going on, and you've got things aliasing in or harmonics coming into our bands of interest. All right. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, let's see, next question. This one is for you, Andre, um, and it is whether or not you could comment uh, on um, what you, I mean, what are kind of weight budgets are we talking about on UAV avionics, and whether this would allow for anti-jammer and multiple multi-array antennas to be used on small UAVs. Do you have uh, anything to say on uh, that? I cannot really comment on the weight, and uh, obviously it really depends on the vehicle, but I, I can comment on the size. You know, uh, when, when you're talking about uh, the anti-jam technology for for UAVs, the, the, the anti-jam antenna, Weight is one thing, but also the size is the other thing, because you have to mount multiple elements, and they, generally speaking, have to be half wavelength apart uh, to do the, the beamforming. So if your vehicle can host you know, the 10, 15 centimeter system, then, then great, you, you can mount it. Um, I'm, again, I'm not really too sure about the weight limitations there. But, you know, along with the weight limitation, the size limitation is, is there as well. Thanks, Andre. I mean, I think the weight would depend on the vehicle with respect to weight limitations, and uh, different platforms would have different limitations, but... Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see, next one. Uh, this one is for you, Stephen. Uh, in addition to, I, I think you alluded to this in some of your uh, uh, slides, in addition to INS and GNSS, what other sensors are typically used or available for maritime platforms? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of systems. Uh, you could go acoustics, like the Sonardyne USB-L system, to give you an acoustic position. There are relative positioning systems, such as laser devices or radar devices that you would use alongside a platform, another vessel, if you need to keep a, a separation distance or monitor a separation distance. Um, the, the problem would be the adaptability to a UMV. Um, it would depend on the UMV side, size, which ones you could utilize and which ones you couldn't. But certainly, uh, acoustics would be one, one way of uh, doing some positioning, or at least being able to utilize acoustics for things like uh, touchdown monitoring and, and other uh, various marine missions. Uh, I hope that answers the question. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next question. Uh, this one is for you, Sandy. And I. And again, I think you may have alluded to it in some of your slides. But uh, uh, it, 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 do you think uh, multi constellation satellites, in other words, uh, multi constellation GNSS, will solve the multi path problem in urban environments? No. <laughs> to, put it, to put it succinctly and quickly, uh, no. I mean, those. Uh, yes, you've got more signals to compare among, but again, you have to know what your truth is. So you, the multi-constellation, um, well, any frequency from any satellite coming into an urban canyon situation will most likely experience multipath. So multi-constellation is just more of the same problem, I guess. And again, you've got more measurements, so you can start doing a better job of selecting it, or, or selecting the good ones, and discarding the ones that appear to be more multipath. But multi-constellation doesn't mean less multipath. It means more signals with multipath on them. <laughs> OK, let's see. Next question, and this one uh, for you, Andre. Um, yeah, in uh, in uh, Unmanned system applications, is, do you think that code phase GNSS is going to be accurate enough, or um, uh, particularly for accurate georeferencing applications, would, uh, would code phase be enough? Well, I have a short answer as well. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, and again, it, um, it depends on the size of the platform. If you, if you have a really large vehicle with, you know, maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 meters, then probably 20, 10, 20 meter size, then you know, maybe you know the you can smooth, smooth the noise and multipath and the code phase measurements to the level where you can do some meaningful attitude estimation. But when we're talking about small vehicles, even one meter size, and you have a submeter error in the code, then you know you have submeter over a meter. You basically don't have a meaningful attitude information for georeferencing from code phase measurements. Okay. Anything that Sandy or um uh, Stephen may want to add to that. 
comments? No, I have nothing to add. All right. Uh, all right, next question. This one is uh, for you, Stephen. Um, in UAV applications, vehicle dynamics can be very harsh, uh, and normally it requires that you use an IMU as part of the solution. Uh, how benign is the marine environment? Uh, is, do you expect, uh, I mean, are they harsh dynamics in the, in the marine environment? Uh, yeah, the, the, yes, they are harsh dynamics, and if you consider also that we're talking smaller vessels, they'll be more heavily affected by those dynamics, um, sea state alone, but even if you have a vessel just designed for harbor use, where typically you wouldn't have uh, uh, rough seas or anything like that, and you, you could possibly not have to have an IMU or an expensive system. You could use a, a, a GNSS system, uh, a heading system to provide heading. Um, that I would think uh, most of these systems are being designed for uh, multi-mission capability, so have to be able to operate in calm seas and in rough seas. Of course, there will always be a limitation uh, depending on vessel size and uh, and mission role on uh, just how rough the seas they'll be deployed. So it's really kind of mission specific for the vessel. I would say the, the answer as to whether or not you could use a, a GNSS only receiver for, for doing these uh, type of operations. All right, uh, let's see, next question. Uh, let's see, actually this is gonna be for all three of you, but let me start with uh, directing this at Sandy first. Uh, one of the issues with PNT is continuity and availability on aerial platforms. Um, Self-masking, is that an issue, and how easy is it to fix that by having multiple antennas on a top, bottom, side on a, uh, on a small UAV? Right. Okay, so it comes down to, on this one, with the multiple antennas and trying to switch between them. Uh, it's a couple things. Uh, one is uh, you've got to handle your handoffs, right? So uh, if you're using two sets of tracking loops, meaning that one's kind of uh, the primary one and one's sort of a secondary one, uh, how quickly they're um, being able to reacquire when the antenna that comes into view, or if you're trying to use a single set of tracking loops and switch the source. So those handoffs can be tricky to do at a tracking level. And then the other thing you have to consider with this too is uh, where else that GNSS position is going to be used for. So you're solving for position at your antenna phase center. So if you're switching between two antennas, it really depends how far apart those two antennas are and how that much that separation is with respect to the overall accuracy requirement um, for your system. So for example, if those two antennas are only separated by 15 centimeters and you're offering, uh, you're operating in a single point to range mode, not a problem. But if they're separated by 15 centimeters and you're operating in an RTK mode, uh, yeah, then you've got more of a problem. Or if you're feeding that into an inertial system as well, and you've got that position sort of jumping back and forth as to where it's uh, physically located. Um, that's an issue. So one of the other ways you can deal with it uh, is to use a single antenna that has sort of a donut-shaped antenna gain pattern on it. So it's a circular kind of donut. Um, and then, again, you're going to have likely have a phase center that's shifting around, making it not great for RTK applications. But if you're sticking to a single point pseudo range application, that might be a more simple approach to being able to get um, uh, rather than having to handle a handoff, you just have a odd-shaped gain pattern on your antenna. And then to deal with multipath, you'll have to rely on the correlator in your receiver. All right. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Next one. Uh, well, before I go on, uh, Steve, do you think you have anything to add to the to that one? Or does the same thing come up in marine vehicles and it's something worth considering? Or Well, on, on larger marine vessels, the, the issue is completely different. On a smaller unmanned marine vessel, you can't get enough separation on it uh, where having a multiple antenna system is really going to gain you uh, any mitigation for your problem, I, in my opinion. Um, and if you're talking you know, way out into the future, some people perceive unmanned cargo ships and things like that. Again, um, antenna location is paramount. You would be on top of a, a cargo uh, ship's mast, and uh, having a multiple antenna system for something like that wouldn't be 
so important. Uh, where mobile antenna systems are currently used in the marine environment are where you have things like uh, giant cranes on construction vessels uh, that are moving across your horizon, your, your GNSS horizon, and causing variable multipath or variable satellite availability. For those types of uh, systems, you might consider a multiple antenna positioning system, but uh, otherwise, uh, there's nothing really to be gained, I don't think. All right. Let's see another question for uh, Andre. Um, can you comment on? Uh, adding vision sensors to unmanned systems, would that help with uh, dealing with the uh, GNSS outage problem? Sure, it will definitely help. And uh, we'll talk about more uh, about the integration of GNSS with other sensors on Wednesday. So we'll specifically talk about using vision sensors. But to, to give a short or relatively short answer, uh, it, it will help uh, to deal with GNSS outages. And vision sensors, uh, video cameras, for example, they are already present on most of the platforms for, for other purposes. So it, it does make sense to use them. Uh, it's still pretty much work in progress. How do you use vision sensors and how you build reliable navigation algorithms based on vision sensors? Uh, there are all kinds of problems. There is an observability problem that you filter when you're talking about the monocular vision. Is seems to be too optimistic in terms of what it's doing as compared to what it's actually doing. There's a problem of you know measurement outliers and things like that. So it's it's a very interesting and you know fascinating research topic. Um, I think there's there's a big value there. Uh, the sensor is definitely going to be especially when we're talking about the UAVs and UGVs um, unmanned ground because the sensors are definitely going to be on the platform and it makes sense to use them. And again, I uh, will talk in more details on Wednesday. All right. Thank you, Andre. Um, any uh, comments on that, uh, Steve or Sandy? Anything uh, about vision that you may want to add? I guess that's a no. All right. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, I guess I assumed correctly. All right. Uh, let's see. So I think we have time for uh, one final question here. And uh, and I guess I'll direct this at everyone, actually, and I think it was kind of a theme of, uh, of this presentation. But let me, let me start with you, Andreas, and then I could, Sandy and Steve could add to it. Uh, in your opinion, or what do you... When you talk about manned vehicles and unmanned vehicles, what is the primary difference in uh, comparing accuracy requirements for these? It's, it's, really, I mean, it's really hard to talk in general. Uh, it really depends on the application. Uh, but to me, probably one of the main differences is not the accuracy, but how you deliver the solution. And one of the, the primary differences to me is that for unmanned vehicles, you have to do it in real time, at least for trajectory control. Uh, Various for unmanned vehicles, sometimes you know it's okay to do it post processing. And the result, it's you know real-time solution. Obviously, is more challenging with unmanned vehicles as as compared to uh, you know where you have a human operator. Sandy, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, it's just kind of echoing what Andre said there. It's really, really application specific. You can have completely different um, uh, dynamics and, and accuracy requirements. So it really comes down to understanding the capability of all the different techniques and, and the actual operating environment that you'll be dealing with. Right. And it's pretty much the same. Uh, just. What Sandy and Andre both have said uh, for the marine environment, it would be uh, mission-specific, vessel-specific, uh, all things kind of considered as a whole, I think, before you uh, could really narrow that down a bit more. All right. I think we're hitting our time limit here for Q&A. So we're going to stop here and uh, wrap up this webinar. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and before we do sign off, folks. Uh, we'd like to thank each of you for joining us and trust that you found today to be of value. And want to issue a special thanks to our moderator, Demo Skebra Exabher, our speakers, Sandy Kennedy, Andre Slovia, and Stephen Brown. And of course, our sponsor and co-host, Noah Talent Inside GNSS.
another quick thanks to our logistics producer, Patty Van Hooser, for her behind-the-scenes collaboration and support. Most importantly, thank you again for joining us. This is Lori Dearman saying, I hope we see you on the next one on Wednesday. Have a good one.